Great. I want to thank um, the organizing committee for having me here and for Nico for always supporting me. And what a phenomenal set of talks this morning. Um, so sadly, mine's going to be a little bit more mundane, um, but actually really practical for practice. And so I'm talking on neuroendoscopic lavage for the treatment of IVH and hydrocephalus and neonates and specifically premature IVH. And to really understand it, we have to go back to embryology. And so the germinal matrix is the source of all the neurons, glial cells, and it's active between eight to 28 weeks of gestation. And so these neuro, neurons, glial cells migrate um, from the germinal matrix up to the um, cerebral cortex. And then it, there's involution of the germinal matrix that goes on to nearly 32 weeks of gestation. And so as a result, these babies' brains are really fragile up to 32 weeks. And that's when we see that IVH of prematurity. So anatomically, the germinal matrix is this vascularized region and is an immature vascular rust. And um, what's really unique about this area is there's arteries, vein, veins, arterioles, venules, capillaries, and they lack um, the basement membranes and the tight junctions and everything that forms the blood-brain barrier. So it doesn't exist in these neonates, which makes them um, so sensitive to any substances the mom would choose to ingest during pregnancy during this time period. They also have really immature cardiopulmonary systems, so the physiology is completely different. So for whatever reason this baby is born prematurely, it's traumatic. Um, and so they, the circumstances leading to premature birth, the first few hours, days of life, everything switching over. To compound it, they have very immature cerebral autoregulation systems. There's no um, Monroe Kelly doctrine, you know, there's none of this stuff really applies um, to the neonates. And so cerebral blood flow autoregulation causes repeated ischemic and reperfusion events in the brain um, that can strain this very fragile um, vascular system, resulting in hemorrhage. And then there's only really one layer of an ependymal lining between the germinal matrix and the ventricle. So it's really easy for it to just spread into the ventricle. Um, this is a great schematic just showing the only three things that we have been proven to help prevent premature babies from bleeding is antenatal steroids, which there's not a lot of time to give them to have an impact, delayed physiological cord clamping, but if the baby's not stable, um, there's no time to delay the cord clamping, um, and then prophylactic endomethacin, which can be given after. There's also a lot of predisposing factors for this, um, genetics pneumothorax, they all have a patent ductus, extreme prematurity. So um, now babies are being delivered from 22 weeks and onwards. Um, low APGARs, male gender actually still remains significant. And then of course, mechanical ventilation, which most of these babies require because they don't have surfactant. Um, we grade these as a grade one is if it's just in the caudothalamic groove or the germinal matrix, grade two spills into the ventricle, grade three, um, you have hydrocephalus and grade four, this is now an intracerebral hemorrhage around the ventricle. Um, so there, when you go from just having a germinal matrix hemorrhage to post hemorrhagic ventricular dilation, all the way to hydrocephalus, it comes from every direction as well. So first there's just the mechanical um, obstructive um, clot related symptoms. Um, commonly the clot sticks in the aqueduct um, because it's so tiny, but also we get adhesive arachnoiditis, especially in the fourth ventricle. That's why we get the trapped fourth. We get fibrosis of the arachnoid granulations, meningeal fibrosis, subependymal gliosis, impairs the mechanisms of absorption. Then there's the inflammation mediated imbalance in the production of CSF. And then we generally say when the post hemorrhagic ventricular dilation becomes symptomatic, then we call that hydrocephalus. Um, we've talked about it at length yesterday um, about all the different mechanisms that impair it. But specifically, what's important to know in the um, premature babies is we don't even have oligodendrocytes. We have oligodendrocyte. Um, the cells that are going to turn into oligodendrocytes. Um, and so all of these toxins are, in, are affecting the cells before they even have an ability to form and mature into their, um, the final neurons, oligodendrocytes and glial matter. And so neurodevelopmental outcomes are particularly poor. So if you have a grade three IVH, so it was in the germinal matrix spread into the ventricle, but not really in the parenchyma, 74% of these infants have cerebral palsy or developmental delay. 
32% are nonverbal and 37% are unable to walk. You take that to a grade four, 97% have cerebral palsy and developmental delay, 59% are nonverbal, 68% are non-ambulatory. Um, and so this increases when the grade of IVH increases. And what the scale really fails to account for is the fact that there, you know, you take a unilateral grade four versus a bilateral grade four, and that's just compounds the brain damage further. So if you look at how um, we historically treated this and how probably a lot of this room went through in training is you rounded on those babies, but you didn't do anything until the head was huge. There's a full fontanelle, sunsetting eyes, apnea, bradycardia, DSATs. Um, and that's way too late. Fortunately, with the hydrocephalus research network and moving things into the modern era, we actually intervene based on ventricular me measurements obtained just in the serial bedside ultrasounds. Um, and so this is the Levine index, um, ventricular index. You can see the dotted um, bluish blackish line is the average ventricular index of normal newborns. Um, we have the 97th percentile plus two standard deviations as our kind of upper cutoff. And then there's this sort of yellow region where we usually start lumbar punctures um, when we see that they're increasing steadily above normal. And our intervention line is 97 um, percentile plus two standard deviations plus four millimeters. Um, and that's when we say you hit that line, you should be lumbar puncturing. And if you're going over it, looking at the next round of intervention. Treatment options um, to date have been repeated lumbar punctures, a ventricular access device, AKA Omaya Reservoir, or a ventricular subgaleal shunt for temporary management. 60 to 80%, and really it's 80%, require conversion to a VP shunt. So, Early attempts at IVH evacuation started with the DRIFT trial, which I think everybody in the room is familiar with. But it was designed to say, okay, let's dissolve it, let's drain the hematomas, let's lower intracranial pressure and reduce the levels of free iron and cytokines. It was initially thought not to be a success because we didn't change the incidence of VP shunting. Um, and there was a high um, incidence of secondary IVH that was reported. I will say you can get that secondary IVH if you put a reservoir or a subgaleal shunt in as well. Um, however, if you look at that follow-up data, it did show improved neurodevelopmental outcomes, particularly cognitive function at two and 10 years. And so I give a lot of credit um, to Ulrich Tamali. He heads up the Berlin group in Germany for starting to push the envelope. So they first came up with a concept in 2014 to say, why don't we wash it out? They're exceptional with endoscopes. Um, and so the first reports of washing out babies actually came from um, using the babies with um, neonatal meningitis, um, which is un unfortunately common in them. And when you put the endoscope in for that, sometimes you see pus, but often it's literally like cotton candy filling the ventricles. Um, and it's fairly easy um, to suction out. Um, and then they extended their experience to doing it for um, inter interventricular hemorrhage of prematurity. Um, and then have elaborated on those techniques over the last four years. And so over the four years, it's reported to be a very promising treatment modality. It allows direct visualization of the hematoma removal, which is what DRIFT didn't offer us. Um, depending on your preference to use a flexible versus a rigid, you can get through both lateral ventricles, you can get into the third ventricle. I personally don't touch the aqueduct, but some do. Um, and the residual hematoma and degradation products can be removed by irrigation. And in my case, my adaptation is using the Myriad. Um, average birth weight is one is 1,000 grams. So I've done as low as 600. Um, average surgical weight is about um, 1.5 grams. Um, severity, grade two IVH, it sounds like why would you operate on that? But it's be not because they started with hydrates, they, they developed hydro over time. Um, mainly grade threes and some grade fours. Um, they are reporting shunting rates of only 60% compared to 100% previously. Um, and um, neurocognitive outcomes, 30% um, of these patients are now having normal development, 78% being able to walk independently with minimal support. And so this is life-changing for not just the individual, but the entire family. And then what's new is they've also been able to report that the shunt revision rate is far lower for these patients. Um, so across Europe, um, they've actually been doing a great job with this. 
Um, and the, what the interesting thing is we haven't brought it to the US or Canada yet. And so um, I'm gonna go through some criteria that the UK just developed for saying who should we be doing this on, which is really helpful. Um, obviously gestational age less than 37 weeks, you're really not going to see these patients in the modern era, except for like less than 28 weeks now. Um, and you've got across the 97th percentile plus four millimeters on the index. Um, and what we do is um, we bring down the baby down to the OR. I don't do anything in the NICU. I don't really consider it sterile. Um, we do a skin incision. You create a pocket if you're going to put a reservoir or a shunt in. Um, I insert a 14, um, I, I actually insert a 12 and a half French um, peel away sheath because I use the little Loda and um, slide the endoscope into the frontal horn, just like you were going to for an endoscopic third ventriculostomy. If the baby is too unstable for an MRI, which most of these babies are too small and unstable, then I just use ultrasound navigation. Um, if we're going back and they've been stable enough for an MRI, then I use stealthy M. Um, we lavage and dissolve clots. Um, and I do that with warming two liters of LR to 37 degrees. I use the um, urology cystoscopy warmer I found to be the most effective. Um, and after it, insert a temporizing device. Um, so for me, it's a VSGS, and then I close the skin. I always do antibiotics, even though there's no data to support it, and ultrasound the next day. And so for example, this is a five-week-old male, X26 weaker, bilateral grade four hemorrhages of prematurity, and post-hemorrhagic ventricular dilation. So that um, top ultrasound is his three-day-old one. We have it on the one day on the newborn. So all of these babies that are born early get a screening head ultrasound within 24 hours. But at that stage, it just looks clot. You can see three days later, he's already started to trap. And then over the next four-week period, it didn't show up great, but there's yellow dots, me plotting off the um, ventricular index. And he got a um, really capped out the clot um, well with CSF on the left side. And so as this was my first case, I actually talked to Oruk Tamali a lot about it. And he said, well, just do one side for now. You know, I don't have a space to take an endoscope into with CSF on the left. And so um, he proceeded onto the OR. Just to show you, their head is basically the size of a peach. Um, and so that is a Peds Mayfield wrapped until I like wrapped three curlexes around it and it was still not working. And then I just shoved some foam in it. And I taped their head just because if you think about it, it's about like putting a toothpick in an olive. Okay, I don't want this head to move. I don't want anything moving to disturb it, but anesthesia can always cut that tape if they need to. And you can play the video. So really rapidly, um, that CSF is clear because I'm running irrigation the entire time. And I put the sheath in, but you'll see in a second, it turns a little bit blood tinge from rundown, like right there. Um, so I actually pulled the um, peel away sheath out at that point. And so that way CSF could equilibrate around it. And this is what IVH looks like four weeks after the bleed. So you can see all the debris, which kind of looks like algae. Um, and this is just the myriad on suction um, because this is the very first time I used it, which I think is important I did because I didn't know what was gonna happen because while there's some great videos out of the Berlin group. They only use a peds feeding tube. Um, and what you can see is that, that kind of cauliflower algae type stuff sucks up really easily. And then underneath it is some firmer red stuff um, that it's hard not to convince yourself on the first time you're like, is that gonna bleed or not? And you can see in this, in this brain, which was about 29, 30 weeks old, thir um, weeks gestation, actually using that, it would collapse each time. And that was just on suction. And so that's why you have to use continuous irrigation going in. Um, and as it was the first time I told um, anesthesia, I said, if there is a glimmer of instability, just call it. And I'll put a, you know, a subgalial shunt in like I would and we'll be done. But actually I was able to slowly, steadily evacuate that ventricle. And it took about 45 minutes for me, skin to skin. I used about a liter and a half of LR warmed to 37 degrees. The baby um, went back up to the um, NICU, was actually extubated to normal, it's um, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, so basically nasal CPAP on them, same day. Um, no secondary bleed on ultrasound. 
So you can see that the left frontal horn looks a lot smaller. You can see how I went down to the foramen on it. Um, I didn't go into the third. Um, no, um, and then the VSGS lasted exactly 28 days, like the child read the textbook. Um, and then his um, ventricular index dropped, picked back up at four weeks. And that's where you can see the bottom, um, sorry, the bottom right um, had ultrasound. And now I had a CSF cap on the left side. And, I've, and what the German group will tell you, and what I firmly believe is you need to enter CSF first to give yourself a pathway versus just sinking it into it. Um, and then at this time, um, he was actually big enough to, or stable enough to get an MRI. You can't MRI neonates because they won't maintain their body heat um, and MRI. And it's very, the amount of tubing you have to run to ventilate them in the scanner, it's way too much dead space, just FYI. So you can see that I'd cleaned out um, the left side really well, but the right side still had a lot of clot in it. Um, so this is actually what it looks like now, eight weeks post bleed. And you can hit play. And so a lot of the previously algae looking stuff um, dissolved, that clot is separating from the ependymal lining. And um, now you can go in there and if I'm not playing the sound, but because my PA is talking in the background the whole time, but you can, she's like, this is so rewarding. And it really is. And then somebody was like, this is basically like putting a Hoover in the brain. And um, I like, personally, I like rigid endoscopy. It also allows me to use the myriad, but um, you can see that this clot is just coming up along with a significant amount of the debris in the ventricle. And it goes without saying that an EVD is not going to take care of all this. Um, an EVD just sort of takes the stuff out of the frontal horn. Sure, you could slide it back a little bit, but it's not getting all of this out of the atrium. Um, and then the nice thing is if I wanted to, I can switch from um, rigid to flexible endoscopy. Um, but this literally just eradicated everything um, in that atrium. And then I can also, because I've got positive um, irrigation running, it's going to wash out um, that entire ventricle. Um, there's only a few more um, seconds left in this clip, I think. And, but like, look at the staining on the sidewalls of the ventricle. Um, so that's all hemosiderin um, that's damaged the ependema. Um, and I would say, so I messaged alert to Molly and I said, um, before I did it, and I said, well, what do you think about using the Myriad? And he's like, you absolutely should, we just don't have it. Um, and I think that this, he, he also believed, and I sent him the videos that this was gonna be a huge improvement on it, mainly just because of time. And also the thing I did on the second one was I got a little bolder. And so um, I actually used the soft tissue shaver um, to take all that out rapidly. Um, so you can see on the post-op post uh, post ultrasound the next day, there's no secondary hemorrhage. There's a teeny bit of debris left that seems stuck. Extubate it to um, non-invasive positive pressure. The SGLS lasted four weeks. He did get a shunt, um, but he is actually now 11 months old. He's had no shunt revisions. He doesn't look like he ever will. He's not trapping his third. He's not trapping his fourth. Um, he does, he's got normal movement of the right side and the left leg. He does have some spasticity in his left arm. He will get a diagnosis of cerebral palsy, but he's not that delayed. He's sitting supported. He's active. He's engaged, um, learning, understanding words. Um, so we've really made a huge um, progress here. So I would say, I mean, I, I think that this is going to very quickly establish itself as, as the indicated treatment for um, post-hemorrhagic um, hydrocephalus in these infants, um, because I, I think overall pediatric neurosurgeons are um, very skilled at endoscopy. I don't think that this adds a technical skill level to it much. I would say it should be done with the myriad um, because it just, it takes down the length of anesthetic time um, for these infants. Um, but no blood loss, um, no secondary hemorrhages in my experience or their experience from Germany. Um, so I would highly recommend it. Thank you, guys. Evolved toward even earlier intervention. So that's that's just it. Is um, I think we are all so careful with these infants that we are wait, you know, that we are waiting till they hit the Levine index of 97th percentile plus two standard deviations plus four millimeters. And at this point in time, as long as you have 
enough room for your scope, I would say, why are we waiting that long? Because if the neurodevelopmental outcomes are better in the grade threes and grade fours, I would have to believe that they're going to be better in the grade twos as well. Um, and I, you know, we know that Coker's Point is a very safe entry pathway. Um, and once again, the timeline to doing this of 45 minutes or so, it'll be even easier to get a grade two out. Um, and so I think that that'll be the next step, just like we moved from in 2000s, not operating until these babies were apneic, bradycardic, and desaturating before we considered them a surgical candidate. The next step will say, okay, if they're 97th percentile on the curve plus two standard deviations, and we've got a CSF cap to enter, let's start evacuating those babies.